Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. My name is Sabi Ahmed. I'm the Associate Director and Curator at the Ishara Art Foundation. Before we begin, let me do a sound check. So that am I audible? Yes, Sabi. Excellent. Okay. So welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, bring you into the fourth transformation of our ongoing exhibition, Growing Like the Tree, Static in the Air. As you might have followed on our website or from the previous discussions we've had and virtual course we've done. This is the second iteration of a show that Saurabh curated earlier this year. It was titled Growing Like a Tree. Uh, the exhibition over the six months had a number of visitors come and experience this kind of a network and a map of interconnectedness that is shared between a number of practitioners in South Asia and beyond. In the second iteration, um, what's going on is that we knew that somewhere down the line, this can't just be growing like a tree, it has to grow into a forest. And so over the past months, Sorab, myself, a number of artists who have pulled in their minds to create this show have, um, have made that forest grow. And the analogy we wanted to bring this time was not only the forest, but something atmospheric, something which invokes a search, an exploration, and that search and exploration is not going out with a binocular telescope, but going out with sound devices and trying to hear the different sounds, the different frequencies that are, that are coming our way, that are crossing paths. Static in the air refers in a way to, to uh, a tuning into radio stations. It's to tune from one station to another, search for the next sound frequency, and in that, uh, discover a place where people cohabit. And so in this moment of transition between one radio station to another, searching for station, searching for frequency, one actually knows that it's a very noisy process. It's a process with a lot of static, it's a process with a lot of interruptions, with a lot of sudden flares in sound, with, uh, with bursts of noise that come into the way and a lot of static as well. And some, in some way, this exhibition is really capturing that spirit of tuning, coming across all kinds of interruptions, delays, other stations, until we take a pause. And how this manifests in the Sorab situation is by uh, the second iteration, not opening in one clean sweep, but rather transforming each day. So from the 11th of September until the 16th of September, this exhibition, the second iteration, opens over six days, over six transformations. And each transformation retunes the exhibition rework some of the clusters, rework some of the sound elements in the work. And the way we have discussed this iteration and the opening of it over the past months it has been also quite interesting because it's not been about how one artwork will replace another. It's not been about how one work will get removed, but rather how new clusters begin to form or emerge. It's about how one work interrupts another, how one work starts speaking to another, and also how some works fade out. It also becomes about how some works that were in the foreground become notations around another work. So it creates new orbits also. And these are all various kinds of curatorial interventions and strategies that went into the making of this exhibition. You can read up more about this exhibition on the Ishara website on www.ishara.org. You can also listen to the previous virtual tours that we've done uh, they, they're all being recorded and they're going to be uh, on the Shara website uh, after we've done the uh, complete opening and arrived at the pause. So today what we're going to be talking about in, in this virtual tour is the fourth transformation. And how I'm going to do it is by talking about some of the things that have changed in this, in this version or at this stage today. This is going to be followed by a conversation with four artists and with Soda. These four artists have been part of the first iteration and the second. So it's a very interesting space now to not just be talking about artists who have been newly introduced, but in fact, seem to continue. Um, this conversation is also based around a, a kind of idea that we all wanted to share together. And this is around peaks. The previous uh, transformations and the tours were thematized around uh, cluster, around intimacy, around collapse and today the idea of peaks is coming from the idea of reaching sonic peaks because there's a strong sound element today 
that we're going to encounter, all of which have amplified in the exhibition. There's an amplification show itself. Along with these peaks, we want to think about heightened senses, which is quite close to some of the practices that we are going to be discussing and looking at today. And by heightened senses, I'm really referring to a higher alertness, a higher vigilance. And this happens actually, if you think about it, in certain conditions, it happens in creativity and in art making for sure, where every nuance is perceivable. Every little detail, every color, every note, note in a musical composition just comes right at you and you have to see whether it's working or not. But this heightened awareness, heightened sense also comes with when one is in danger, when one is under threat, and when, when one is in some kind of a precarious situation where every element, every, every object in your surrounding is charged with a sense of urgency and a sense of danger. The ground beneath your feet is in a way trembling. And so this heightened awareness is also one of the things we want to discuss in today's discussion around peace. So without further ado, let me quickly tell you who are the artists that are joining us today. We're joined by uh, Farah Mullah, who's based in Mumbai. We're joined by Nida Mabu, who's based in Lahore, with Sarkar Patik, who is currently uh, in Dhaka, and Ritu Sarkar, who's also in Dhaka, and of course, Sohrab, who's curated uh, and uh, in discussion with all of you about this, um, this exhibition. So, Let's get inside and see what the transformation is about. I'm going to go behind the camera and take you through it from a point of view. Thank you, Neha. So if you followed the previous transformations, one of the most, uh, one of the earliest and most apparent transformations was Jessing's work here, which was uh, a, a, a set of images superimposed with text um, uh, titled, um, I Feel Like a Fish, that was right in the middle of this. And that has now turned into one single notation up there around the work that has emerged in this exhibition by Zainab. Zainab has created this work over the past year during the pandemic and has shot all of these photographs in Kashmir uh, during the lockdown, which uh, is not to be mistaken for the fact that the lockdown is a double lockdown. It's a lockdown because of the pandemic, but also a lockdown because of the political situation there. So this was the first eruption in a way that comes in with heightening colors. But along with that, we've had several others um, which we went through over the past three days. Another intervention that came in yesterday was uh, this combination of notations by the packet who are based in Sri Lanka. Some of the members are in London at the moment and a dot matrix printer that is sputtering out reams and reams of prints. And these prints are images sent by uh, the packet collector that are being relayed into the exhibition. This itself creates a kind of sonic element in the show because you have this screeching sound that runs through at very odd hours. Interestingly enough, the dot matrix printer does not just go on printing nonstop. In fact, it sometimes takes a short breath, a pause, uh, when it's printed too much, and then it resumes. This is accompanied by another sound element today, which is the open sound of Ritu Sattar. Ritu Sattar had created this work titled Lost Tune. Until recently, until yesterday, this work was presented with headphones. So anyone who wanted to experience it fully would come sit on the bench and with their headphones on, would immerse themselves into this. Now, this work, this work sound becomes ambient. And a lot of visitors who come in don't even realize they're entering a different kind of sonic environment because it somehow just merges in this kind of a, an ambient cacophony, which in some cities in the world is just all around you. In Dubai, there's a rather quiet environment in many places. In the exhibition spaces, it's obviously usually more quiet. So here there's this kind of ambient sound. And the third sonic element is Faramullah's work, which is titled uh, Oral Mirror, which until now it has been taking in sound. It's exerted a pull in the exhibition towards one corner where sound is, is, uh, is taken in from three microphone inputs. And then a mirror kind of effect is created as there's a delay echo back a kind of ambient uh, frequency of uh, mirroring that happens. So one is actually listening to a feedback of 
the sounds already been created and introduced by visitors. But along with these sonic kind of interventions, one of the notations of Jessing, which until now notated his own work, now uh, until yesterday notated Zanat's work, a photograph of Narmada River, and someone tiny breathing there, calling out possibly to us, has blown up into a large notation. It almost creates a sounding pattern. It is practically the largest image in the exhibition, but it's also notated by uh, photographs by Satish. This was a wall which until yesterday had Satish's works town board. Interestingly enough, both works by Satish and by Jessen have an autobiographical element. In fact, even Faraz and Zainab too. So there's a cluster that forms around different autobiographies layering one another, uh, coloring one another. And Jessing's, uh, Jessing actually has been based in Tamil Nadu in South India. And so has Satish Kumar, whose work was here until yesterday and has now, like a, like a pixelated snake, crawled over to this side and has also enlarged and extended. Both Satish and Jaising are based in, in Tamil Nadu. And so there is a shared regional kind of affinity yet. There's, of course, uh, uh, a, a rather big difference in the kinds of context that they grew up in and the kind of upbringing that they had and, the, and what their work deals with. But there is an element of Satish which continues to stay on. And that is his, his title, Town Boy, which kind of captioned his work when it was presented here. And now Town Boy remains, but Jessing notation comes in. And one wonders whether the Town Boy also refers to more people in this exhibition who identify as Town Boy or Town Girl. I am aware that I think the frequencies of this, uh, the sound frequency of this work is not caught on my microphone. I hope you can hear a little bit of it. But during our rehearsal, we realized it's actually not uh, as audible as it is when you're physically present. The clusters that Nepal Picture Library has brought in um, remain so far. And I wanted to just bring your attention to the red thread. This red thread has, has had a strong presence in the show because it found its way into uh, a print by Nida, one of the photographs, Nida Nabi was with us. Also, in a book by Yu Yu that was placed on the desk. This thread kind of, in some strange, uncanny way, seems to just flow out now with a pink mark, a pink, a pink hue through this printer. But the thread also seems to just extend right across to the red of Bunu. And this is a work by Bunu that was there in the previous iteration. It remains here unchanged and yet changed because everything surrounding it is changing. You know, there was once an interview of James Baldwin in which he was asked, do you consider yourself a revolutionary writer? And he said, I'm not sure if I'm a revolutionary writer, but I am a writer writing in revolutionary times. And I think that says a lot about how when times and your surroundings change, you're, you're actually someone else too. This is a work by Nida Mehu. Previously, we had these four frames with anecdotes that she shared with in Urdu. And three of her photographs align to these, these first top three that were there in the same size. In today's transformation, those three photographs fade out and an amplified image from Nida emerges. And this amplified image is in fact of a speaker with some red pigment. It looks violent, it looks uh, rather vivid but it's also floor covered with rose petals and the pigment, almost suggestive of blood. This speaker visually almost channels its own kind of sonic presence. You don't know whether the sounds are coming from this speaker or this speaker or from the lost tune or from Sir Karpatik's inside. And as you can see, the printer has taken a breather back on. I hope some of you can hear the printer sound. We also, until recently, had Sean Lee's work here. 
a series of photographs titled Two People. But this also faded out, and in its place arrived a work by Kushal Ray, who was with us in a conversation yesterday, with the title of a work called Intimacy. This is only one photograph from that series of Mrs. Chatterjee and the house where, and the family and house where Kushal lived for some years and shared in photographs. So it's one photograph that now comes in. And Sean's story is now notated by a photograph that has a very different relationship that his parents share since he started the series called Two People. Changes the tone of Adresso. Which then brings me to Sohrab's own address that was previously on this wall. If you remember from photographs for your visit to the show, there was a set of notes, handwritten notes by Sohrab on this side, on this side, and a photograph of a sunset or a sunrise. Sohrab will tell me, I forget. But these notes were, uh, were uh, notes that some, well, notes that he'd written in 2007, um, talking about his relationship with his mother and sharing vulnerable experiences with everyone in this show, but also with visitors who come. That note has receded. And now we have a letter that Aishwarya has written facing this exhibition. It is in English, but actually it's a uh, it's, uh, it's Tamil, transliterated into English. The translation of this will be available on our website and in the exhibition brochure. Ashwarya, if you remember, is actually occupying this wall with a large set of photographic prints called Kadinge. If you come to the exhibition space, you will realize that actually the notation by Saurabh Bhizan hasn't completely disappeared. In fact, Faint traces of it are still around. These traces you might get as you read the walls. And when you read them, you can faintly make out the word photography somewhere, the word role somewhere, the word mother somewhere. But you may just miss it if, if you don't pay attention. So there's a lot. There's a lot on the walls, sometimes subtly present, sometimes very visible in the past. As we go in, the reds continue into Sarkar Pratik's work. And another sound element, and another sound environment engulfs you as you come in with this work titled Origin. This entire space has this immersive feel where four videos um, illuminate one another. Sarkar's work has this faint red glow that will now surface. You have Rahi Punya Shloka's work that got introduced day before yesterday. There's a strong sonic element here, which also brings in sonic elements of the scratch. I don't know if you can see the colors. I think my mobile phone isn't capturing the color properly when I see it from a distance. It just looks like an illuminated white screen. A work by Munim Wasif, which also has a strong sound element. But it's all on headphones. And a notation by Rux Media Collective has been introduced. If you remember, there was a notation by Dainita Singh previously, which stays on so far. And there's a new notation that's added by Rux Media Collective. Sorry, citation, I meant my mistake. And the citation is basically also meant to evoke the fact that on the one hand, we enter the exhibition, say, with a note or address by Sohrab, now an address by Ashwarya. And at the far end, far corner of the exhibition, we have another set of notes being inscribed in this work by Rux Media Collective. A work titled 31 Days. And this work, basically makes you conjure or makes you invokes a multitude of figures, situations, scenarios um, that one can think of over the past year during the pandemic that surround us. 
So this is broadly the transformations that this exhibition has undergone today, until today, until day four. I'm going to now hand it over to Sohrab. He can tell you a little bit more about why we're going to be talking about peaks and how he's envisioned some of these um, transformations that have been introduced into day four. And then we'll start the conversation. Sohrab, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sabi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so when we're thinking about transformations, um, we're thinking about change, which is um, always kind of not smooth. And uh, sometimes it's violent. And, and um, these uh, peaks started to kind of um, erupt in front of us as we were kind of programming, you know, choreographing uh, the switch. And, um, and, and for us, um, the, fir the first day we began with a big cluster change, which was a kind of a visual peak. At some point, uh, we wanted to allow for um, all the sonic elements to kind of overlap with each other and sort of live in their sort of uh, multitudes and which became another peak for us and um, um, I think I think what we're imagining in the show is um, these constant kind of ups and downs we didn't want change to kind of come into the flow in, into the show in one um, sort of uh, smooth calculated uh, shifts where everything shifts equally um, and uh, you know, for me, I think um, what I've realized over the last four or five days is that um, I'm always trying to catch up to what the space really is doing because it took me a while to figure out that when we were imagining the show, we kept talking about how iteration one is shifting to iteration two. Um, there was a kind of a direction in some ways, but when we were installing uh, the fourth transformation yesterday, I started to realize that actually the second iteration was emerging out of the first. So it wasn't so much about, you know, um, um, the, the first heading into the second. And um, what we also started to recognize was that the more um, people faded out, including me, my addressal, and uh, more you know, as many other sort of, um, uh, as much other presence that I have is slowly starting to fade out. Uh, in some ways, um, what's happening is that we are becoming part of the milieu. So nobody's really disappearing. Um, and and um, one of the sort of privileges of working in such a slow changing exhibition was that um, uh, there was enough space for all of us to kind of realize what was happening as things were changing. So in the beginning, we thought that we might remove uh, Dainita's citation as soon as Ruck's citation goes up, but somehow the presence of two citations worked while we were transferring. Um, and I think um, the slow sort of transferal has allowed us to kind of make those decisions to also keep some of those um, you know, um, overlaps um, without necessarily, like it's been an elongated overlap. So even, you know, both um, um, Rux and, and, and Dainita existing together in, is in some ways a sort of a peak within a citation space for us. So um, that was the gist in which we were trying to, uh, in a way, shift one landscape to another. And in between, there were many other landscapes and it's only, I think I can articulate it today that um, what is emerging is a new landscape out of the old one and not so much as, uh, you know, a movement towards. Um, so I'm going to now actually go back to the artists and I'm going to give Sabi the space to open up the discussion for the artists and I might come in sometime later. Uh, everyone, please switch on your camera if you feel like it. No pressure, but whoever wants to, it would be nice to see you. 
Oh, Ritu, hi. You've joined. I was a bit worried because we didn't hear from you a little while ago. And we also have Pratik, no? who's in some galaxy at the moment. At least until a little while ago he was. All right. So um, I wanted to actually just open straight into questions um, because I've introduced the, the idea or the theme that we wanted to discuss around, which was peaks, uh, heightened senses, amplifications. But those amplifications also connected to, say, political escalations. And, you know, again, quoting Baldwin, um, there was once something he, he said in another interview, which was around how um, um, being, some, being a Black person in America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, he was very aware that he had to just be very alert to the fact that he's, there's, there are threats all around him all the time. And this makes you see more. It makes you see everything. And it actually wants, it makes you need to know as much as possible about everything that surrounds you, anything that can actually come and uh, be a problem for you. And he, he mentioned this in the context that those who are oppressive, um, and in his context, it was um, white people in America and white uh, nationalists in America um, who, who, well, they continue to be around and have um, all kinds of political views which are deeply problematic but they don't know as much about me as i know about them they think they know me but they don't know me and i'm able to see much more than they're able to see so there is that dimension of heightened senses which has a strong political dimension uh, as much as uh, just a purely formal thing of being able to hear see um, sounds, colors, or something. And not that that's necessarily the direction this will take our conversation today, but this is the broad ambit within which we're discussing peaks, amplifications, escalations, heightening of senses. And I think in this exhibition, somewhere, it is an awareness of the other, awareness of each other, being able to listen in when someone is calling, um, and, um, and, and also listening in when uh, someone is addressing you. Uh, therefore, hearing, voicing, uh, being listening to the other is as much, a, and listening to oneself is as much, I think, part of today's discussion. So getting straight into the Q&A, well, now it's not straight anymore. Um, I wanted to actually first ask uh, Farah a question, because her work is very directly, I mean, it, it, it's passed on or continued from the first iteration into the second and will stay. Um, it's a work that actually, if any of you have not heard or seen it, um, it the three microphones take in uh, sounds uh, from the surrounding, pick up certain frequencies, and those, those sounds are relayed back via the two speakers. They're processed via a, a software that Farah has coded, and so an encoded kind of feedback or reflection occurs sonically, uh, orally in this work. And obviously a work like this that is so responsive to its environment um, is going to change with the environment each time it's relocated. This is the first time it's come to Dubai. It has traveled to other destinations before. I suppose it would have started in her studio. So the question I wanted to ask Farah was that as she developed this work, possibly in her studio, how has the work changed with every destination it's gone to? And I know you've not come to Dubai, but at least you've gone to for this exhibition yet, but at least you've been to some of the other destinations. So maybe you could tell us a little bit, number one, about this work and also about what changes when the environment changes around it. Thank you for having me, Sally. And thank you for the question. Uh, so the work is called Oral Mirror, which is basically what it's, doing it's mirroring the sonic environment back towards you um it, the idea sort of emerged from a dressing room wherein the mirrors face each other and the images sort of dilute until all you can see are the mirrors reflecting each other i wanted to do something similar but then the idea of an echo came in and an echo is just 
differentiated by each, by being made up of one or more distinct discrete repetitions of the original signal. So in essence, you realize that it's an echo by the sound of its peak. And the kind of signals that are coming out from it do sound noisy. They're like dense layers of different sounds overlapping each other, wherein you think that there's an absence of signal, but actually in effect, it's an overabundance of the signal. Now, uh, we, are, we were also thinking a lot about how sound directly informs space, location, and hence echolocation, your location within the space that you're occupying when you interact with this installation. And that's exactly what it's done from the studio to a couple of other places is every space, every audience has resonated differently with it, wherein it sounds different. We've also played around with different senses, wherein in one location, initially, the whole installation was in pitch black darkness. So you take away the sense of seeing, which in effect heightens your sense of proprioception within a space. So it was very, very overwhelming. And I was asked immediately to keep the lights on. The, the surrounding ambient space also sort of plays around with your sense of space within you know within the gallery space or the studio so it's been a different ex experience with this installation in each and every location and i think that's what's been interesting about it wherein it you know for me personally having you know experienced all of these individually it does bring a sense to my sense of awareness of where i am located within the space and where you know where the listener in this case, the microphone and, you know, and me, you know, we're sort of asking this question about like, who's listening? And that in effect brings attention to yourself. And that's, you know, that peak of awareness of your position within the space. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, because there's so much feedback um, process built into the work, uh, did you ever encounter a lot of distortion? like? Because, I mean, at least in the electronic generated media, feedback leads immediately to distortion. Um, I wish, in fact, sometimes um, feedbacks on websites, uh, when you have to keep giving reviews and give feedback to customer care, if the feedback there had some process of distortion, I wonder what it would do to their systems, where you get a completely distorted response. But coming back to your work, what is the... Uh, what do you do? How do you deal with distortion? Because that's something over here we had to constantly deal with that there was enough ambient sound that goes into the mic and it amplifies so quickly that there's this burst of like rumbling in this exhibition space. And then we have to switch it all out and then switch it on slowly again. That's what it's supposed to do. Mm. It's supposed to bring your awareness because in a sense, there's no such thing as silence. Mm. So what's actually happening, you're listening to the room, the space, the emptiness within the room, the electricity being transmitted, the wiring, the plumbing, everything being fed back into this feedback loop and being played to. So it is sort of like a self-awareness for the room, the space in which it is located as well. But I think we could just turn the volume down for the moment. Mm. If it's yeah, that's loud. what we've had to do. Got yeah. it, thank you. Nida, can I come to you uh, with a similar question of when you change environments, uh, what happens to the work and how do you deal with new contexts in which your works get shown? Because there's a, there's a specific history, there are specific historical subjectivities, there are specific um, political conditions that your work refers to. And um, uh, as your works travel from one place to another, get shown in new contexts, there's always this question that one has to face, which is how much one can explain, or how much should one explain the context from which this work is made? How much should one explain what this work is about, as opposed to letting people find out? And because there are specific histories that your work brings together. Um, um, is this a question that you have to deal with? And if so, then how do you deal with the changing environments of the work? So I'm very much aware that if I, if I take out all the context from my work, um, they can be contextualized in any way possible. 
Um, and I'm not okay with it. I want to contextualize it because there's a personal motivation that is involved um, to make this work. But I find out that usually I have to explain a lot. There was this um, one particular incident where I was explaining my project and it was for an interview for this grant. And um, and then they were not, con like, you know, they were, con I, I spoke for 10 minutes and then after that, they were like, you know, but what is the problem? Like, you know, they were interested in the mm -hmm. theology of the issue. And then I had to speak more to explain the theology. So, so my work was left behind and I had to explain about the issue because when they think about Pakistan and minority, the first thing that they ask, oh, is it the Shia minority? Like, is it sh the Shia minority? So I feel that I, I have this need to explain a lot all the time. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not okay with it because it feels, now I feel, it's, I feel that, you know, I don't need to explain that much, like, you know, so, but uh, but this time with this work, um, I feel that it with these uh, handwritten notes, I am con contextualizing the issue, but not in a direct way. Like you know, so it's there, but still not. It's it's not too loud. Um, I'm, I'm I'm aware, and usually it's 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 places like it's mostly Western countries where where when it gets displayed or when I'm talking about that, I have to explain more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, in this exhibition, you even use texts, um, anecdotes written in Urdu. Uh, we had a discussion between ourselves whether we should offer translations, where finally we decided, no, for those who want to read, they will read. For those who can't, they might get someone's help to come and help read if they're that interested. Uh, in fact, we've had some visitors coming and reading for others who, I don't know how that happened, but I actually noticed someone talking to a stranger and explaining what the text says. And so there are these ways of mediating sound also, or mediating readings also, mediating a linguistic kind of uh, uh, awareness from one to the other. Um, have you used texts in your work in this way, uh, in other contexts, maybe in books, maybe in exhibitions? Um, not in this way. This is the first time that I've tried that. Sarah made me do that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I did it because uh, now, so now I'm very shameless. So I was very embarrassed that, you know, what if my uncles and my brother, they would come and see the exhibition, they would read these texts. And, and usually in our family, we're not okay with like, you know, sharing these stories. And it's, we, we're not very like, you know, we don't talk about these things. Um, so, so by doing this, um, I'm like, you know, that, that is over. So now I'm okay. I can dive more. So it has, so there was this barrier before and now, now it's gone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on. We'll do a full circle of more questions to each of you after in response to some of what you said. But Pratik, can I ask you, uh, the next question, which is actually a slightly different one. It's not about a change of environment, but a change of form and medium itself. A lot of your photo photographic concern seems to be about light, which uh, in, a, in a rather specific way, a kind of blinding or transcendental light. Whereas in photography, so much of light is about offering more clarity to an image. Um, in yours, the light becomes abstract. It actually ends up diluting an image. It ends up making the image fluid. Um, but with the work that we're seeing here, it's a rather immersive work. It's a sound and video installation. And I know in previous exhibitions, it has been shown in an enclosed environment, which makes it even more immersive and isolated. Here, it creates an immersion along with other works. So what I wanted to ask you was, what made this shift happen from still photographic or photographic images that are in print to these inv uh, immersive environments that you create through your work. Thanks, Avi. Um, so I think the, to answer your question, I think because this work was done in 2016, uh, so the, the, it will reflect like that time also, like where, you know, where I was and what I was thinking about image five years back. And I think some of that still is there now. Um, but I, as we talk about heightened senses, I think one of the thing when we go work, especially in the outside in the world, uh, you know, we are working outdoor, we are already in a three-dimensional space where we have distance between spaces, we have 
you know, we hear sounds, we see things, we, we have a sense of smell. Uh, so we are already very much active in that sort of heightened sense. Um, what I was missing at that point was when I was showing work or seeing the work uh, in an exhibition, that experience, that heightened experience was missing. Um, because you know, eventually it, it comes into a two-dimensional image, which only has uh, the visual part in it. So, and which, which that point I was, uh, I think, feeling something not fulfilling enough. So I think that is something to do with my uh, realization that I think as much strong as still image and a photograph can become, it can, it does obviously as many other mediums has its own limitation. So origin was a work that, uh, that was my first attempt, I believe, to kind of uh, uh, work around it, that how can a, still a series of still image can create a more sensorial experience or immersive, as you said, uh, especially the installation that I made in Dhaka, um, which was enclosed and it was very, you know, long and uh, enveloped with sound and everything. Um, it al also, because I also wanted to create a space where the viewer comes and, you know, spend longer time rather than just, you know, just walk past by work, which often we see, and especially a busy city like Dhaka, no? like there are many people who come. And so that was an intention to create. So uh, the way I would feel perhaps when I'm working, affected by so many other things, by the atmosphere, how can I transform or create that atmosphere uh, in that space? Um, and that, that is why I think also the reason sound became part uh, because that helps. I think, I think a lot then of an image can do. Um, I was so, going to ask this, that this could have just been a purely visual work. Why was sound added? But yes, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that, but also because I came into uh, more visual practice later because my practice was before with sound. So, and then I discovered, you know, photography and I was very much excited about it and I loved the medium. Uh, but I think it was also around that point, I felt like, okay, there was this, you know, history of me working with sound and, and that's also me. And it's just two different mediums and how can I collaborate between the two mediums? So it was also like a first attempt of... Uh, very naive. I don't think it was a very conceptual uh, intention rather than uh, my own uh, interest or background and how can I, you know, merge them together. Mm -hmm. So all everything kind of fell into that point of when I made Origin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll move to Ritu and then we'll come back later to you, um, Pratik. Um, Ritu. Uh, my question to you, at least to begin with, is a much as a very straightforward and simpler one. How did this work even begin? And I mean everything, every detail. And because bringing sixty-five musicians together, then creating this kind of a soundscape. It's interesting that at least with the three of you here, Farah, uh, Sarkar, and yourself, all of your works have this element of ambient interventions. You create uh, an ambience uh, through your work. And some of it may be immersive, some of it may be confrontational, collisionary, um, that does not allow you to get immersed. Uh, in your case, actually, as much as one might be immersed in it, it's actually jarring. You're hearing this blend of cacophonies um, in this. And actually, you can't even locate where the sound is coming from, whose sound uh, you're listening to at any given moment, at least not from the video. And there's something of that that's happening in the exhibition as well. You can't locate the source from where the sounds are coming. You can't tell whether the sound in the darker room is Pratik's. You can't tell in the en entrance space whether that's Pratik's sound or someone else's or Farah's or whether it's Ritu's. And you can see this kind of blend from one to the other. But in your case, how did a work like this even come about and how did you make it happen? Good. Um, how did the, you are listening well, right? 
I'm sorry. Are you listening to me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry that uh, I was not out. No, it's good. The sound is perfect. Good. Sorry that I was mm. not present in the rehearsal. I am uh, right. right now. I'm just doing a uh, doing my film, uh, so it's just mm -hmm. right at the end. So it's like I'm in mess. Uh, sort of uh, lost you in this. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so this work uh, started in a very modest way, basically. I was in Calcutta um, uh, and uh, it was a very short residency and I was asked to take a, um, uh, take a workshop for rehabilitated uh, sex workers' children. And they came, 10 of them, 13 of them, and I was just uh, in a loss, like, you know, how to make a workshop with them and on performance art and all of this. And, you know, the, the first two days went really well. I found them pretty um, the, uh, pretty uh, engaged and um, also provocative uh, by their performative attitudes and all of this. And then on the second day, suddenly it just striked my mind um, and I asked them, uh, can you uh, collect uh, harmonies? Uh, uh, is it possible? And uh, two of them were basically from the localities and uh, they knew like all of the people and they are not actually sex workers children, rather like, you know, coming from middle class backgrounds. So both of them told like, you know, it's very much possible. But the other children, they said, we never played a harmony. Uh, and uh, although their mothers, many of their mothers, they play, uh, they never do it. So I said, uh, let's try. If we can bring, then we will see if we can make something out of it. And then the following day, I found like, you know, nine beautifully tuned, well varnished, beautiful reeds, harmonies, uh, um, sitting at a corner of a room. And then for me, it just strikes so suddenly that, you know, uh, it would be impossible to collect these harmonies, such quality harmonies in such a short time in Dhaka. And, uh, and then I stopped there because I was making two other performances. So I didn't have any mind space to think about those harmonies, but I worked with them. I just gave them like, you know, just, you know, uh, just sare, gama, padha, nisa. So seven reads. And there were like 13 of them. So I, I repeated the same read with them. And then I just said, just uh, what you have to do is uh, keep patience and, uh, and uh, if possible, um, can you just hold the read for half an hour? That's it. Let's see what happens. And then I asked them to see it. Um, like, you know, I have this uh, pretty, uh, what can I say, um, sort of like, you know, symmetrical attitude in my mind, always, whatever I like to do. It's sort of like, you know, symmetry in a mess or a noise. And there is some kind of symmetry in the mess or noise. That's what I sort of do. And then I, just, you know, let them sit in a row and column and, and that's it. They hold it for half an hour. And I thought like, you know, it's, um, uh, it makes sense. And coming back to Dhaka, um, I thought like, you know, there was the Asian Art Biennial uh, coming and uh, I was asked to do a performance for the opening and uh, and then, of course, 2016 was a very difficult time in Dhaka uh, because of blogger killing and other political um, uh, uh, problems. And, you know, all of us, especially artists and performance artists or the people from theater, actresses, uh, were, you know, asked to be a bit, you know, uh, 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 a bit like, you know, uh, come down or not to show faces here and there everywhere. And I thought like, you know, maybe uh, we should, um, uh, I should do this uh, with the music organizations. And there were, you know, um, and, and suddenly I also started feeling like, you know, how uh, I am also a minority um, just because what I do as an artist. Um, so that really striked my mind. And I thought like, you know, this performance actually encompasses many boundaries and, uh, 
Um, and by noises, I can actually talk about uh, many sorts of noises. We are always um, uh, uh, we are always um, immersed into. And I went to the music organizations, 16 music organizations. I went and I actually explained uh, why do I want to do, and especially the music organizations I went, all actually practice classical music, uh, what are well um, recognized, but not never well received. They, they, they always practice them, but they are not popular. They don't earn money. So they're always like sort of ignored. Uh, so as artists, uh, these, uh, these kind of artists are basically minorities. So the feeling basically were very like, you know, well lined. And uh, when I explained, and also I wanted to talk about uh, our political crisis and the political crisis related to our neighboring countries. And, uh, and of course, the, of course, um, mm, of course, partition uh, played a role here too, because um, there was this uh, image in a newspaper um, where um, a Hindu village was attacked uh, uh, by, um, by political goons, but uh, you know, this is a Hindu village. So of course it's a minority issue and they actually, they always do it. And this kind of uh, pictures are always available in newspaper, but this time, this particular picture struck me because a harmonium was um, basically uh, uh, was broken by something, by sharp uh, material and was, you know, thrown somewhere and the picture was there. Mm -hmm. And that was another reason I wanted to do Lost Tune with a lot of people and as many people as possible and wanted to create this noise, a, a symmetrical um, uh, sound, but as it is a collective uh, um, uh, gesture, so it mm -hmm. became a noise. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's how mm -hmm. Lost Tune came. Thank you, thank you. So actually very interesting things come out of this. Um, and they actually speak to some of Saurabh's own concerns. So I wanted to pull Saurabh into the circle of our questions and answers. And it's because I found, at least in the years of knowing your work, following your practice, that a recurring interest you're drawn to is of spillages, is of flows, of things just spilling out, not being contained, whether it's images, whether it's sound. And you can see why sound becomes an important kind of uh, presence in the way you think and in, also in the exhibition as a way of something seeping into something else, something spilling out into something else. Um, Ritu's work, Nidas, Faraz and Pratik's are doing that in some interesting way. So maybe you could, you could say a little bit about this relationship that you have with sound, with amplification, with peaks, in your practice beyond just the exhibition, what is it that that has kept you there for uh, time and time again? Well, I think that um, okay, we are talking about peaks, but what I actually see happening are squeezes. You know, um, so we are living in these heightened senses, and uh, you know, I mean, just to go back to Ritu's work since she just spoke, you know, with Lost Tune. She's also written, once there was a country where there was music in every home, stories of music, murmuring of tunes. Once there was a time when school holidays, school holiday mornings were passed by pumping air into harmoniums in some local music school. And she goes on to ask, where are those mornings gone? Where are those people now? Remembering them, my heart aches, loses its way. She goes on to invoke, you know, names of some people who is not very clear to us, but it seems to be very specific. May Sudhanshu returns, may any Sudhanshu return after fleeing away. And of course, you know, she talked about 2016, where uh, there were a lot of blogger killings, uh, which were happening, which even in India, we were reading about, you know, um, and there was a sort of a shift in the political atmosphere. In some ways, um, I feel that, uh, or connecting to what, for example, Nida was talking about how uh, for her, the context is really important, but sometimes what makes her feel uncomfortable is a context that is imposed onto her or she's forced to kind of take on. 
to be able to explain and you know you asked how much do you want to give how much do you want to hold you know um or for example uh what farah was talking about locations echo locations and also being able to locate themselves um a few days ago i think we had a conversation where we were talking about abstraction what abstraction really meant and the only thing i could say was um in a way sometimes the unfamiliar becomes the abstract sometimes i think we are made into abstract because someone can understand this and sometimes i think we choose to pick on the abstract to use it as a code to infiltrate in some ways back you know so in a way there is the circulation or is kind of an oral mirror happening here as well and uh we also living in a time where um i feel like there is a kind of visual numbness that is coming about so uh if you know when pratik was talking about is just a two dimensional image uh we are flooded with images we are flooded with two dimensional images and i feel that you know in april i had covid and i ended up losing my sense of smell and that was scary you know and uh for a long time i was only smelling burnt matches and that changes my that really changed my perception of what i saw what i ate i actually feel that in the end especially the time that we are living in today where we are there's a sort of a fatigue um at the same time all of us are also reaching out to a sensorial experience as people consuming those experiences and people who are making work i feel um, from a visual space for example you know uh pratik and nida where even the loud speaker becomes a metaphor i feel that that's also squeezing out of some some ways i feel uh sound is maybe just one of those squeezing out you know um in a way i think um what we are developing here together or you know what i'm seeing forming here is uh a sort of folding of many different um um addresses in the form of different sensorial experiences which are uh sort of coming together to form something much bigger you know so uh which is why i guess we were talking about how in the first iteration it was the same work by ritu you know where where it was on loudspeaker uh, it was on headphones and um there was uh, protics sound that was spilling in to mm. many of these other sort of works where i think uh, because pratik was looking at this idea of origin beginning you know whether it's universe or you know wherever else it's coming from and i don't know maybe it was also made at a time where there was a sort of a longing for and this is something maybe pratik you know can answer where uh if 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 it really did exist when he made that work where there was a sort of a longing back towards a different space again mm -hmm. locating to where he was at that moment of cacophony that ritu was you know putting out with her work um but in general you know uh, i think the silence from ritu's work uh the ambient silence and also the spillage of um pratik's portal of longing in some ways you know um in terms of the sonic uh, capacity with mm. a little bit of disruption coming in from farah i think it gave it it was almost like a blanket that kind of um, gave a certain tone mm. um i feel in some ways um i would see a big shift in someone like bunu's work which does end with that scream and 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 uh, how it kind of in a way is now um you know enveloped in 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 this very shrill you know almost a cacophony of 65 harmoniums playing together uh some of them seeming to be a little out of sync um because it changes the meaning so i actually feel that um uh, you know it's it's kind of what the exhibition is doing where we are talking about locations where we are talking about context i think sound becomes context in that phase you know uh, where we are talking about addresses who is the one who is addressing um for example my map has disappeared from the first iteration and we have uh jessing's map that has kind of come in in some in a way it's like a seed you know and i think everyone here almost everyone here is also ended up making their own maps in the mm. first iteration which we hope to kind of pull put out now mm. which uh, in a way 
make you go back to the same space in a different way because there are a lot of these interconnections that we saw, you know, how uh, Jessing's map somewhat, uh, you know, if you were to imagine uh, them all on transparency sheets, somehow there would be these connecting points if we sort of laid up, you know, laid out each one's map one on top of the other. Mm. So sound for me is uh, personally, and I mean, I, I would actually go back to Ritu now uh, and actually, I would open it up to everyone here, you know, is, is sound political for you all or is sound a sort of a mapping for you all? You know, in case of Ritu, it's felt political to me, given, you know, uh, talking about how the change of harmoniums playing in the morning, because I also remember growing up with this wafting in of music from the neighbor's place. So there was this felt sense of community as well with sound that I mapped my neighborhood with, you know, where I lived. And that now, in Ritu's words, has been replaced by the howling of dogs at night, for example, whether it's loneliness, whether it's, you know, it makes me imagine a sort of a more inward space where people have kind of gone back into their homes and there is seeming to be a different kind of a landscape. So I'm, I'm wondering if for you all, sound kind of forms, uh, maps out some sort of a landscape. Can I, can I? Notate your your question, Sora. Uh, because you know, when I used to work at an archive, once someone asked me, "Do you think the archive is political?" I said yes, and there was nothing after that. So I was like, "Wait, th- what? What do you want to ask? Um, if is it just a yes or no answer?" So, um, is is sound political? Yes, right. I mean, I don't think there's anything that's not political. Uh, some people try to depoliticize things, um, and there's a politics to that. Um, so everything is political and sound certainly as much as everything else. But how is sound political to each of you? And which is why I did that um, is, mm. is sound a mapping of a landscape, which could be anything, not necessarily yeah. political. For me, yeah. the political bit was just to, in a way, yeah. pin it back to Ritu and then open it up for, yeah. you know. But um, also everything. to, I think, everyone here. So, yeah. Yeah. Nida, you want to go first, or oh, sorry, no, I, let me not change the course. I was just thinking, but let let's start with Ritu. Sure, go for it. Uh, I think um, for Lost Tune, um, it it is like you know, sure and ob- obvious that you know the sound was political because uh, uh, when you can't can't say many things, when you can't really point to many things, when you need to be, um, you know. Uh, compromised uh, so then how you can be like a statement uh, so um, uh, uh, I think that was in my mind um, the, uh, that was in my mind in many ways and but it started with a very modest thought um, the modest thought was uh, like when I first found those nine harmoniums in that corner of the room uh, it, it actually stayed with me. The feeling stayed with me. The feeling of, uh, uh, what can I say? This is a very strange kind of feeling. Like, you know, when did these things uh, um, were vanished from our life and why? Mm. So this question stayed with me and it started poking me. And, uh, uh, and then actually it, uh, it started um, uh, uh, to have its legs and hands and brain and hairs. Um, but, uh, but then why uh, harmoniums uh, um, uh, are invisible here in this life? Um, that is a very complex question mm. uh, because how we are questioning our identity now. In our childhood, what was our identity and how you, we used to be introduced and who we are now. And then now it's very complex for us artists, again, when we actually, uh, we, when we are represented, um, represented all over the world, um, then what happens to us? Who are we? The moment someone actually, uh, uh, the moment my face is there, the moment uh, my accent is there, um, uh, I think the, 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 the larger crisis starts um, start coming in and pouring in. So sound to me is a, um, is a very interesting point of departure where, um, where actually as an artist or I don't know, maybe, um, maybe a normal listener also encompasses many of uh, 
her or his feeling because music is the uh, greatest uh, or sound is the greatest uh, form of uh, sensorial uh, act or feeling. Um, um, yeah, I want to stop here if you have any other questions. Can I add something? I'm sorry I'm moderating, but I'm quite actually interested in bringing this in. Something that R Ritu brought in and something that Nida's work evokes for me, um, and especially after Ritu made the reference of a smashed harmonium as just being so loaded with the political event that's just happened. And you know, the immediate thing that came to my mind was that for the longest time, and even until today, the one emblematic image that is, that is used, at least in journalism, to represent a riot in South Asia is a burning bus. Let me just show you very quickly. I've just done a Google search of riots in India and the number of buses you see burned or scooters. Yeah. And somehow I think um, there, I mean, I, I can't remember just now, but there's an essay I read, either it's a burning bus or a burning tire. And I think it was Kishore Parekh who had once shown a slipper or a shoe or boot, I think, uh, representative of the, the, the partition and the liberation uh, war in, in Bangladesh, right? Of that time, the, the partition violence. And one really thinks that there are certain images that, that have dominated one's imagination when one thinks of uh, religious and political conflicts in South Asia. And when you mentioned the harmonium just now, it just makes you think, wow, like you never imagine a musical instrument standing in for something. Um, and I think I, I, this one really stay with me. And this actually to me also adds to some of the images like that Nida has used of a speaker, for instance, that has been introduced in this exhibition. And along with say, answering, I mean, if anyone just Googles riots in Bangladesh, riots in Pakistan, riots in South Asia, it's just interesting what kind of, what images seem to stand in for something. And you, you brought in a loudspeaker, which when I saw this work for the first time, it made me immediately think of two broad angles. One, the loudspeaker of rallies, political rallies. Um, and second, the loudspeaker of religious kind of sermons or something, or, or, you know, loudspeakers outside of mosques or something like that. And I was interested to know, besides the question that Sohrab is asking about the, the kind of political dimension of sound and mapping a landscape, the significance of the loudspeaker in this work, um, whichever way you want to go, Nida. Yeah. So for me, for me, sound is a constant threat. For me, this loudspeaker represents, it is, it is the most cruel, widely spread, uncontrollable weapon that is used against this particular community that I'm talking about. Um, and and, and so, so the sound from the Friday sermon and to the sound of the angry men in, in a procession, and it dilutes to the sound of like, you know, hate speech by your teachers, by your colleagues, your friends. So for me, sound represents a constant threat. Um, and with this particular image, I just wanted to point out that the, like, I wanted to hint who the perpetrator is, where it starts, um, and and just hint towards the violence that it creates. Like you know, um, yeah. So yeah. that's violence that's what loudspeaker yeah. represents. Yeah, I mean, you know, one can't ignore the fact that on the one hand, voice uh, is absolutely crucial when one thinks of identity. Who is get who who has a voice? and who is not being uh, given a voice. Um, and there was a beautiful essay by Rancia I read some years ago where uh, he was referring to uh, old Greek kind of uh, books and, uh, and accounts where, and this is way back, but he was saying that there, was, there, there were several accounts where some people's speech or some people's words turned into noise were made to sound like noise. This person is blabbering. This person is ranting. This person is just screeching and is making no sense. And some people's words are supposed to make a lot of sense. And you can see where how dehumanization happens when someone is someone's voice is being rendered into noise. So I think it pulls you into a much a more nuanced understanding of sound where you, you don't just look at sound as some formal kind of 
um, uh, element, but in fact, where there's a there's a, where sound is being rendered as voice, where voice is being rendered as noise and blabbering, and um, and the kind of polit politics around that. But I think your answer was was brilliant, Nida. Um, uh, Farah, uh, uh, Sarkar, do you want to come in on Sodab's question? So, I mean, sound by itself is political. Whether, I mean, whether we're speaking about sound as language, as accent, whether we're speaking about music, which is organized sound, sound, and I'm talking also about silence. Silence can be very political as well. I think Nida's image cramped the silence, you know? It was a perfect example of that. I mean, sound is a weapon, is always weaponized, and will continue be, to be done that way. It's used in sonic warfare, wherein a lot of the loudspeaker as a device was a weapon to assert a certain ideology, to drown out an individual voice and opinion within a sea. So sound's quality of just being amplified, just the quality of loudness in itself is political in that move. And there's so many permutations and combinations that are being used. Uh, you know, sound being tuned to a particular frequency has a different effect to it. You know, a lot of musicians coming in auto-tuning their voices as well as a political stance within the kind of culture, like the music culture that's been going on. So yes, sound is a loaded gun, definitely. Thank you. You know, uh, a recent work that Lawrence Abu Hamdan is currently showing, and I think it's uh, Trondheim, um, uh, one of the Kunsthalers in Trondheim, where he's really looking at uh, the explosion that took place in Beirut uh, uh, in August last year um, and how it shattered glass. But this explosion, this massive, massive explosion, um, and one of the loudest explosions that has happened since uh, in the past few decades um, was preceded by sounds in the sky that sounded like jets, like mm -hmm. fighter jets. And there was yeah. some kind of suspicion as to whether this was a, a, a bomb blast, a bombing or something, until it was cleared that no, it wasn't. But uh, what this kind of brought to attention was the number of jets that are flying over Beirut very regularly as a kind of scare tactic that keep people on the edge. And their jets constantly uh, flying over certain cities and Beirut is one of them and, and until today, and Israel is involved in that. And, um, and this kind of uh, sonic jet kind of propulsion sounds, um, when, you're, when you're living with every day, there's a sense of um, threat looming at all times, and obviously very in a very charged way um, in your in your everyday environment. This, uh, uh, you know, sound has a very tactile effect as well. A very physical sort of uh, population of this effect is when, so when a sonic boom happens, when it is when you know the pressure waves in the air travel faster than the speed of sound. That's when you hear that whipping sound. So that's a very physical affect that can be felt and your mind your subconscious mind is a beautiful device wherein these these events these sonic events are recorded as pathetic triggers so every time you hear a sound that's a sonic trigger which will inadvertently trigger a physical reaction to it which is obviously like self-preservation and defense to protect yourself and that's a very natural sort of human Thing, you know, of survive, you know. Precisely. So, Precisely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sarkar, do you want to come in on Sorab's question? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you know, about everything is political. Not. I think even the medium or different movements of medium has their own politics. When uh, uh, John Cage wrote the famous piece called Four Minute 33 Seconds of basically silence or he doesn't play anything. That was obviously a very conscious political act. Um, but that is within about the medium. And, and then again, also during that time, the 60s, 70s, many American musicians started 
or electronic musicians, they started to move, move away from the more melodic structure of music uh, and to more uh, exploring the frequencies of sound. And then, then there's a whole new genre or movement that started and which still goes on so widely. Um, so I think mediums also have their own, uh, you know, conversations or contradictions. I think uh, what I think Sora was mentioning was their sense of longing. I think obviously it was there and many other things also felt around that time regarding images and also, as you mentioned, the idea of abstraction and the work, this work, obviously, the images are quite abstract. It, 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 it can be something like a quasar, it can be also something like the blood, the blood that's in your blood. So there's a whole, you know, big scale that is missing. And then, and the sound hits, uh, that I am also trying to create here was also abstract. It was originally written in 2014, but over the two years, I amplified it and manipulated it to a point where it was stripped of its musical structures and became a more abstract uh, flow of sound. And, and I think that was, and the overall whole this thing was also a kind of, desire to create, create something which has no context because sometimes i feel that when we are looking and reading and experiencing many work of art i think there are very important contexts at the same time the context can be also too overwhelming and sometimes too much and as the audience i often question why that is that context is really necessary and what if we can experience something without any context? And I think that that is because often how we experience music, right? We or when there's not any words that is put in the music, how do we still read it, be able to read it, and and not over intellectualize it or over contextualize it? So I think that was also another um, kind of desire at that point, uh, yeah, personally, for me to kind of you know make something that doesn't need any context so and that that even again that also becomes a politics right a, a political move i guess so yeah i don't know what you think so thank you um can i also open it up to the floor in case anyone has questions do write them in the q a or in the chat um so Rab, your response to their responses no no, no i was just uh I was just opening up a conversation. That's all. I, I mean, uh, in some ways, um, uh, I think I think what interests me about um, all their works is that um, I think I personally feel that you know uh, the world that we are living in, uh, there is constantly a need to to um, uh, to in a way bypass something, and I feel that in our um, it, it, it's a, it is an image driven world and it is an image driven world uh, where uh, images are being manipulated they are being weaponized and so on and of course sound as well like for I was mentioning but i feel that some somehow there's such a dominant span of attention towards the image that uh, it's a bit like uh, you know that work because you talked about Lawrence Abu Hamdan he done that work where uh, with I think uh, forensic architecture where they um, was it in Palestine where those bullets were fired the sound, the sound and, of a bullet yes yes and and mm. it was to do with the sound of a bullet because I feel that um, in a way there's so much attention being evidentiary of attention being given to the image where uh, even the perpetrator or in this case uh, the government is able to kind of you know, um, cover up. Um, so sometimes uh, I feel like a lot of the cover ups are happening visually at the moment, at this moment of time. So somehow um, the sonic element can be used to uncover, you know, what has been hidden in that sense. So I feel that as someone making work, um, I think that, and especially in certain parts of the world, I would definitely not say that I'm from that part of the world, but because even within India, there's so many different contexts, but I feel that, um, um, you know, the voices that you were mentioning that are not being heard, that are being sort of pushed down. I, 
like how do they kind of um, uncover what has been covered? How do they kind of, you know, slip out? So the slippages, I feel also become strategies in some ways, especially when, and I'd written this piece, which didn't get published, you know, where I was talking about images being masked, uh, being masks, where images are also codes, but at the same time, um, you know, I think to understand those codes, sometimes sound haptics you know we are in a way moving on to other senses in some ways um which can give us a much more uh holistic you know um understanding of the image which is the common sort of uh, you know which is the basis of this exhibition for example or for most of the practices there and uh, which is why for me it's interesting that uh, I mean, of course, Farah is coming in from, you know, she's an insertion into the space, which I think is a very necessary insertion. But many of the other people here, I feel uh, like you were talking about, you know, um, the clusters also being about shimmering. And I feel like uh, the practices are kind of shimmering and not just contained to the image, the way we recognize image to be. Yeah, you know, I think this exhibition, at least for me, uh, really points to some, some new directions that um, are now, if not already, then going to be integral to image making discourses. Um, and coming from practitioners who are in investigating, interrogating, unpacking image making in the ways that you all are, you all have kind of presented in, in, in the works uh, brought into the exhibition, but also independently in your own practices. Um, the trembling image, the image that somehow crosses over into sound, into immersive environments, not just the image as a window to the world or image as a mirror to society. The mirror is rendered into an echo feedback kind of environment, um, ambient kind of things or clusters. So a lot of the discussion we've had, in fact, to me, have really pushed me to see, oh, this is, you know, like it's, it, these are where I think image making discourses are really going to be um, headed, if not already and practice is already showing those. There is something, uh, there's a question that's come in from Himanshu. Um, so let me just read it out. Um, and there's also a question by Pedro de Almeida. Oh, hi, Pedro. Uh, we met some years ago. Uh, I'll read both of them out so that um, um, both of everyone can have some time to think about it and answer. Himanshu's question first. So Rab's curatorial thoughts on the sonic within the exhibition is a durational act or reoccurring as a temporal event. Um, taking from the title by the packet, I think about, and the title is The, ti uh, the Heavy Weight of Tiny, Tiny Little Things. And that's the title of uh, the packet's work in this exhibition, a beautiful title, Heavy Weight of Tiny Little Things. Um, taking from the title of, by the packet, I think about the sound within the exhibition, a tiny version of ordinary things, reaching a certain peak and an upheaval. The objects of inquiry by Farah's mirror, Pratik's portal, Rahi's distortions, the packet's graphic sound has, has brought out countless forms, but there's a multitude of dematerialization of sound as well, whether it's in snow or silence in Zainab, uh, Narmada's flow in Jaising, Bunu's silence or scream, Nida and Ritu's voices of concern, Wasif's khayal, Ashwarya's personal anecdotes has brought out a rather asymmetrical form of the sonic. Um, so the, this is also a kind of reading of the show that Himanshu has generously shared. But I think the first part was brought up as a question that, uh, Saurabh, your, your, your thoughts on the sonic within the exhibition as a durational act or as a recurring temporal event. How do you think about, what, besides work, how do you think of exhibitions as a durational act? Um, is something I think Himanshu's question might be pointing to. Um, and Pedro's question, thinking about Pratik's mention of cage, the sound as a medium employed in contemporary art necessarily, or perhaps more accurately, inevitably, lead to more formalist explorations that eviscerate context. That one's to Pratik. And I think it's open for anyone else to answer. So Rav, do you want to go first about the exhibition as a durational act? I think it's the sonic within the exhibition being the durational act and not just the exhibition. And I think that uh, maybe it's a bit of both. Um, I think the 
um, in a way, uh, it's about I guess um, you know when we first started. I think I think the first um, mapping out of the exhibition, which wasn't about you know who do we ask to be to participate right. in the work. When Sabi and I were talking, uh, it was more about movement, uh, and, and and for me, I think uh, in the end, space becomes the work you know uh, for anyone and and which is why i think the question to farah was also interesting because how does the same work what does it become in a different space uh, is it really the same work at all or is it a totally different work in that sense or a different iteration how do you relate to it so when we were talking about it uh, what was important to me and, and that's i guess my starting point for the exhibition was more in terms of the movement how do we affect uh, you know, how someone is entering the space, where does one go to? Um, I think uh, we were both very, we both didn't want a movement that just went along the walls, which sometimes photography, you know, in, in the usual sort of forms is put out. In. Uh, I think it draws people to move along the wall because very often that's the limitation of photography. Even someone like Denita Singh has been trying to sort of, um, you know, which is why she's been working in the museums to bring it away from there. Um, so for me, what was important was um, this element of echolocation. That, that's something that kept coming back to me, which wasn't only something to do with sound, but more to do with how do I um, experience a work in a much larger milieu? Um, even if, for example, it was in the context of seeing one image placed to a multitude of other images and at the same time maybe what are the other spillovers so we wanted the exhibition to be formed in a way where um, no matter where you stood in the exhibition there was a different landscape that you encountered a different sort of coming together different web that was being formed and the sound element was part of the web it wasn't something necessarily uh, different but um, for me, I remember when I, uh, I think Ritu's work was the first work that I had imagined, uh, along with Nusha's, which we couldn't bring in because in a way, um, you know, uh, and strangely, both those works I'd seen together in Palais de Tokyo many years ago. And I remember um, uh, it was maybe right after the Beto sort of cluster, it was on a television monitor and the sound was kind of you know, how I, I guess Sabi was talking about how you don't even realize that the sound is there with you. Mm. Um, I watched the work and I went on, but I remember for the next 20 minutes, even if I went into a different room, somehow Ritu's sound stayed with me at moments. It was really there, like in an echo. And it was also there in, and I, I guess I was imagining it because I think the drone, you know, the, the sound itself sort of had uh, an inertia. You know, so that was the first work that I thought of only because I remember that it stays with you. So the experience was more of someone taking you through something like how, for example, we've been having these walkthroughs with Sabi kind of taking me through, you know, uh, the exhibition. So I'm going with him. Uh, I imagined the experience of Ritu to be with Ritu visiting all the work. So what has happened right now, I feel is along with the many addressals, in a way, Ritu's, Ritu's work is also, I, I don't have the word for it yet, because I think it's the first time I'm articulating it. So thank you for that, Himanshu. But in a way, I think it's a different presence, you know, where um, if I'm visiting Jai Singh's work, uh, I'm visiting Jai Singh's work with Ritu. If I'm visiting Farah's work or, you know, uh, Packet's work, even if there's a clash, it, I imagine it to be some sort of an argument, you know, so I'm part of a conversation, the three of us together, you know, so um, I think, I think for me, the sonic element, which is Ritu's part has become durational in some ways, because um, um, we, we have, in a way, amplified the sound right now, in, you know, in this iteration. But I do think that there has been a pres presence of sound throughout, you know, whether it's been Protic sound wafting in, you know, it's never, it's not because even a sound is kind of not in one scale, 
like how maybe Ritu's sound might be, but um, I feel it's a mix of both. But just to kind of give you an element, uh, an idea of how sound kind of became, you know, uh, part of that. I, I hope I answered your question in some way. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, uh, Sarkar, do you want to address Pedro's question? But you're muted. And if anyone else uh, wants to come yeah. in on it, this yeah, will be our last question. It can be everybody can, you know, mm -hmm. join. And so, I, hi, Pedro. Nice to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think you know it's always tricky, especially for I think when sound is employed with image or visual. I think that can always be that's a tricky space. I find and it, it's really tricky and um, even I struggle many often in many cases you know it can over dominate as a, a, it can be imposing obviously sound is very imposing in the same way like how do you not let uh, dominate it more than an image perhaps and i think those are the things uh, when it's uh, when it works i think that that's a good way of you know applying it sometimes there are cases when it might it may feel unnecessary or too much um but i think when like you look at the works of like not John Cage, but even like artists like uh, Steve Reich or Brian, you know, like people who have worked many years with sound and how they investigate sound or, you know, builds those installation. I think those are, uh, those are very, you know, interesting implementation in com com contemporary art. And I think that's somewhere I find a lot of uh, inspiration perhaps. But I, I think I'm in a position still where I, I am still navigating, navigating in that space. Uh, and it does sometimes feel like uh, not always necessary, to be honest. Uh, but sometimes it does work. I'm still learning, I guess. But thank you. Thank you. Farah has a response also to Pedro's question. Oh. So formalism basically is a concept when the composition meaning is entirely, basically it's determined by its form. And that is kind of the context that an artist or a composer approaches it with, as opposed to in music concrete, wherein you know you are making pre-recorded sounds and then using those as samples. So I mean, in just to answer your question in short, it doesn't eviscerate context, but rather it is the context. Mm. Yeah, that's why I mentioned those artists especially because they base very much focuses on that media and its context. I think. I mean, like it's just opening up sounds and letting them be just that devoid of content and intent. Yeah. Thank you. You know. Uh, the question of eviscerating um, um, context um, makes me think of maybe um, um, maybe us needing to rethink what what do we mean when we say context uh, in a work of art, and oftentimes it's treated as the source where it comes from, the context to which it belongs, the context in which it was made, and uh, in in Urdu or Hindi. There's a there's a term there's a question that often gets asked with a specific power dynamics. Where are you from? And that question really comes with actually a power dynamics of with that once you respond, I know where you belong. Um, I know what your place is. And we know the power dynamics of that way of contextualizing. But there's another way of thinking about context, which is what context do you produce? And which is not about where you come from, but rather what you are producing, what you are doing, what place or context can you produce when you, when you practice, when you're saying something, when you're uttering something, what do you open up? And I think the, what do you call it? The, the contention against context for the longest time and sometimes for the right reasons is this, the earlier, the, the former kind of approach to it, which is where are you from? Tell me so that I know exactly where you belong and where I should be placing you, as opposed to, I think, a political invest, investment in the context, which is 
What are you producing in the location? Because everything exists in a context. So what is the context you are producing for the work that you are? What are the conditions you are producing in which the work is encountered? Um, or at least what is the context you are proposing? Uh, and I think that's where the question of formalism then gets complicated. Because if, if formalism is treated as, an, as a self-referential kind of uh, uh, technique of understanding the structure of the work, irrespective of the context, then one is, in my personal opinion, one is making the mistake actually of forgetting the fact that the structure is within substructures and one is in fact creating multiple structures around, uh, around a work. One is not just structuring a work, but structuring the, the world around a work as well. Um, and so the purely formalist approach to me seems like, a, seems like a difficult thing to relate to. I know that's not what Pedro, where Pedro is coming from, um, having met Pedro and followed at least some of his work and thinking. But I just thought uh, at least I can bring this up. A purely formalist way of listening to these would be this mode of listening called acousmatic listening, where you suspend all notions of from where the sound is originated from mm -hmm. and just listening, bringing your awareness to the now. And I think that really frees up your Pre, you know, pre-learned notions about, okay, that sounds like wood, that sounds like concrete, or that sounds like metal. So mm -hmm. I think musicians and listeners have tried to address this, and it is a tricky question, mm -hmm. but like, you know, black or white sort of a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also want to leave with one thing, and I don't want to have the last word, so someone can please come in after me, but which is that I think it might also be a good opportunity to think outside of the binary between, say, voice and silence. I think with peaks, we were interested in sort of bypassing that binary of voice or sound versus silence, and that sometimes silence can be oppressive, sometimes silence is a right. Um, in a lot of Hollywood movies and in specific arrest things in our arrest, police arrest scenarios, there's always this famous line in Hollywood, you have the right to remain silent and all of those kind of things. But um, instead, of, instead of going with these binaries, that even when it's about sounds, let's look at its gradients and the various readings that those gradients allow us to kind of delve into, whether it's amplitude, escalations, all of these. But let, not, let that not be the last word. Anyone wants to come in? We've crossed by 10 minutes and we can end the discussion. So Rap, I think you should do it. I'm, I'm oh, good. Dear. Oh dear. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you everyone. This is very generous of you. And uh, I mean, I think I learned a lot in this conversation about some of your works and how you approach it. Thank you everyone who attended. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking uh, about the fourth, no, the fifth transformation. And this fifth transformation is um, going to have a virtual tour just like today. So Rab, can you remind me what our fifth transformation is? Uh, it's Khayal, actually. It's Khayal. And we're going to be joined by uh, Munim and Prantik. And um, you can check our website for more details. Um, and catch you tomorrow. But thank you. I think Ashwarya as well. Ashwarya as well. Correct. Passive, Pratik, Ashwarya. Correct. 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 Yeah. correct. correct. Um, yes, exactly right. So thank you, everyone. And have a good evening or good morning, good day. Um, see you all tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.